Hello and welcome to Africa is home. My name is Jean Paul. The tension between Rwanda and Congo is on the rise once again due to the situation in the eastern part of Congo, which is further deteriorated due to war in recent week between the Congolese army and the resurgent M23 rebel groups. The two governments continue to swap blames. Kinshasa has accused Kigali of supporting and backing the M23. Kigali has also accused Congo for supporting the FDLR. The historical diplomatic relation between the two countries is under immense pressure. The African Union is calling for peace and dialogue, but neither of the governments have not yet reached the peace agreement. Joining me now to discuss about this issue is the co-founder of Africa is Home, Platini. Thank you so much. And our honorable guest, Claude Gadebuke. Claude is a co-author of the book called The Survivor Ancestor and the executive director of the Great Lake region. Claude, thank you so much for thank you joining so much, us sir. today. Thank you for joining us. Oh, thank you all for having me. I'm so excited to be home. Africa is home, indeed. All thank right. You. Thank you so much, Claude. Now, the situation has escalated again uh, between Rwanda and Congo. Mm -hmm. Now, a lot of people think this is a new situation. This is a new issue. Uh, what is the root cause of the current situation? Uh, so I think your question, uh, I can answer it in two parts. There is a root cause and there is a fact that it's not a new situation. Uh, the... Congo is a very rich country. It's the richest country in terms of natural resources. The minerals in the Congo are worth 24 trillion T, the letter T, 24 trillion dollars worth of uh, minerals in the soil of the Congo. And that is at the root of all of the conflicts in the Congo because everybody wants a piece of Congo. Everybody carries a piece of Congo. Do you have phones, everybody? You either one of you, Platini, Jean Paul. <laughs> yeah, I do. I do have myself Congo. right here. <laughs> right. <laughs> you're, you're carrying Congo. I'm carrying. I'm carrying the Congo right here, and um, it's like the minerals out of the Congo right now are so important. There is the gold. There is the lithium. There is the um, um, the coltan, which is used in electronics. Um, there is so much that you know uh, the 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 minerals used in electronic cars. Um, the uranium, actually, like even like the bombing of uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the uranium in in those bombs was um, from the Congo. Um, so there are so many things. Medical devices are made with like pacemakers, for example. They, they, the minerals from the Congo, they are a part of those things. So the Congo's riches are, are the root of why there is so much strife in the Congo. It, it's a shame that a country as rich of, as the Congo in terms of uh, natural resources is so poor in terms of how the people are living. And Congo's riches should not be a source of a source of um, um, a, a source of anguish and, and pain and suffering and immense atrocities in the Congo, as we have seen. So when you ask about the M23 and the tensions between Rwanda and Congo not being new, and you, uh, you're absolutely right, it's not. This is not new. Um, the M23 is the latest name, the latest acronym that Rwanda has used to invade the Congo. It's both Rwanda and, and Uganda, by the way, have both invaded the Congo. <laughs> both countries are backed by Western powers. The US, the UK, much of the European Union, and a number of other countries. Um, and that is why, um, and so to go back and make it simplify it for, for, the, uh, for the, um, the audience, 
I know, you know, Africa being home, Africa is home. I'm sure a lot of people on the continent, um, you know, they're looking at this and thinking, you know, Kagame is right because Kagame is one of the best presidents that we've got in Africa. Many Africans think that. Many Africans say that. Uh, I would say congratulations to Kagame. He's done a really good job of running a PR campaign to show an image that is actually opposite of what he is, especially when we look at the Congo. So where does the M23 come from? As, as I said, M23 is the latest acronym used by Rwanda and Uganda to invade the Congo. Before that, the M23 had another name. If we go back to the late 2000s, 2007, 8, 9, um, the M23, the M23 had a name of the CNDP. That's another acronym. Before that, the CNDP had another acronym. It was the RCD. RCD. And mm -hmm. before that, the RCD was born out of another acronym, the AFDL. Yep. That's the original. Yep. That Ka Laurent Kabila brought. Our, yep. Yeah, I, I, exactly. It was Lauren Kabila, who is mm -hmm. the, the, the father of Joseph Kabila. Both right. of them ruled the Congo from 1997 Six. to 2000. Yeah, yeah to 2018. Mm -hmm. It was father and son for 21 years. It was one as was a father and then a son. The father was four years um, assassinated in 2001. His son mm -hmm. took over and they actually were the at the head of this rebel group called the AFDL. But yeah. how yeah. did the AFDL actually come into the Congo and take over the Congo and oust a long serving dictator, uh, Mobutu, Mobutu Seseko, uh, who had mm -hmm. ruled the Congo for 32 years? It was Rwanda and Uganda that formed the AFDL. Mm -hmm. And then the FDL invaded the Congo. Mm -hmm. The first thing they did when they went in there, you know, it was basically a cover. The FDL was a cover. So M23, again, we're talking about the M23. These are like, right. these are the previous generations oh. of the M23. It yeah. goes way back to Rwanda and Uganda. Uh, let me stop there because it looks like you had a question. <laughs> yeah, I was just say to put it into context because M23 is basically the descendant of FD, AFDL. And right right and then it appears as if every time a situation escalates in the eastern part of an attack the new acronym comes out you know mm -hmm. fdl became rcd mm -hmm. they became so what is the historical context of these acronyms so the um uh these acronyms it's it's um at first when when the congo was invaded by rwanda and uganda rwanda used the pretext of um going into the Congo for security reasons because they were saying the refugee camps were causing insecurity inside of Rwanda. There were a bunch of refugee camps of refugees who fled Rwanda in 1994 mm -hmm. during the genocide and the war. There were more than 2 million people that fled uh, outside of Rwanda. And so <clears throat> they made this case saying that these refugees posed a security threat to Rwanda. They invaded the Congo. The first thing they did the Rwandan army with AFDL and the Ugandan army, they went into these refugee camps and they massacred the refugees. And if anybody's seen refugee camps, it's like basically like large, a large area of a bunch of tents, people living in tents, people living in poverty, people who barely have a bathroom. They went, they killed women, children, I um, mean, infants, the, um, their goats, their chickens, they killed everything that they could. They bombed them, they killed them with hand weapons, they killed them with everything. They surrounded those camps and they killed as many as they could. And as the refugees fled, they chased them all the way across the Congo. This morning, I looked at how many kilometers it is from Goma to Kinshasa. It was, it was around 3,000 kilometers. It's they chased yeah. the people all the way across. Uh, and 3,000 kilometers is is about you know like 1,200 miles or something. If I'm, mm -hmm. if, I'm mm -hmm. if I'm if I'm estimating correctly, it's over it's a thousand miles. 
Yeah, it's three to four. Uh, it's two to three hours from Goma to Kinshasa by plane. So by by, it's, by it's flight. So they went all the way to Kinshasa. Mm -hmm. Isn't that the capital of Congo? Congo? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead, sir. Sorry. And, and, and by the way, the um, the 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 chase of the refugees was also a takeover of the Congo. And so both Rwanda, once Rwanda got there, when the first Kabila, Lauren Kabila, took over the Congo, the military chief of staff for the Congo was a Rwandan general named James Kabarebe. Mm -hmm. Today, this guy is a general in Rwanda. He was a general in Rwanda anyway, but let me go back to, um, let me give a little bit of uh, background. Even the FDL comes from an other acronym. That acronym is the RPF. The RPF is the ruling, the ruling party inside of Rwanda. That's Paul Kagame's party. The RPF was born out of the NRM. The NRM is the ruling party in Uganda. So all of what we are seeing today started in Uganda. 1980 or 81, Museveni, the president of Uganda, lost an election. After losing an election, he started a war with his group called the NRM. Mm -hmm. The NRM recruited a bunch of Rwandan refugees. Uh, there were many Rwandans who had fled to Uganda in uh, 1960, 1959, 1960, uh, when a social revolution that was violent, actually, um, it, it ousted the king, the Rwandan king, and basically removed the, the monarchy and installed uh, a republic. So those refugees were in Uganda. Museveni recruited them. Among them was, was Kagame. It was also Fred Wigema and many of the others include, and, and one of the people who was in the, the so the, the and, and these guys, they fought in 1986, Museveni wins the war in Uganda. Many of those guys become leading figures inside of the Ugandan military and inside of Uganda, including Paul Kagame and Fred Wigema. Nice. In the late 80s, they formed the RPF, but they were still part of the Ugandan military. In fact, in 1990, when the war started in Rwanda, Paul Kagame was in America at Fort Leavenworth in training as a Ugandan officer. Paul Kagame, the president of Rwanda, was training in Fort Leavenworth as a Ugandan officer. And so then he came back and he, he, he after they assassinated the initial leader of the rebellion, um, Frederick Gemma, Paul Kagame took over. The RPF fought a four year war and they won, but at the, at the tail end of that war was the Rwandan genocide. And that Rwandan genocide and that war, the end of that war is what pushed 2 million people into the Congo and the surrounding countries who were fleeing the war and the genocide. Then two years later, the army, the Rwandan army, pursued, you know, followed those refugees into the Congo with the AFDL. So I hope it gives you some history. But what we are seeing today with the M23 is Uganda and Rwanda's product. M23 is commended by the uh, the by the Rwandan uh, president Paul Kagame and Rwandan soldiers. In in fact, um, it was a couple of weeks ago. I tweeted and said, um, people were saying, uh, I mean, the M23 was complaining that they had a, P a talk, a peace talk or some kind of talk in Angola. Yes. And they were saying, I was that they were, that. Yeah. right, they, they were saying that they weren't invited. And I said, no, the leader of the M23 was there. It's Paul Kagame. So <laughs> what we are seeing with the M23, <laughs> what we are seeing with the I'm M23 like... is Rwanda is just taking cover because at some point the sponsors the americans the british and in the in the in the in, in other westerners other western powers basically say you can't just be out there you know occupying another country for many years paul kagame and many of rwanda's leaders um especially the military leaders were saying oh we're not in the congo but the military chief of staff in Congo is Rwandan. He came from Uganda. With we, we know it. 
We yeah. know it. Even the police, police yes. yes. Correct. Yeah. And then the he goes general to Rwanda and the colonel. An officer. Yes, he's an officer in Rwanda and he's an officer in the Congo. So myself and my brother Kambale, hopefully you one, one day have him here. We call them criminals without borders. You know, you have doctors without borders. You have you have right. journalists without borders. You also have criminals yeah. without borders. Criminals without right. borders. Right. So, right. so these, these criminals without borders, this General James Kabarebe was with Kabila when the FDL started. Today, we know that he is one of the top sponsors. Him, General James Kabarebe, General Charles Kayunga, General Jack Nziza, all of them very close with Paul Kagame of Rwanda are the ones who finance, um, they, they provide logistics, they recruit mm -hmm. and, and they do all the fighting in the Congo. They, they send the fighters into the Congo. Many Rwandan soldiers have been caught in the Congo fighting. And when they yes. took over the border near the border of Uganda, how did they, how did they get into, if, in, this is to demonstrate that Uganda is also involved. How did they what, get behind place? the Congolese soldiers? They came through Uganda. So the Ugandan soldiers are also involved. And yes. the part that they invaded, this very latest invasion started from, you cannot go and fight in the Kibumba area without the backing of Rwanda because you're going to get your butt kicked. Yeah, Absolutely. That makes sense. And I know Platini, you want to uh, dive in just real quick. Now, you gave a uh, uh, history of how the acronyms were formed that... Mm -hmm. uh, Museveni recruited the Rwandan refugee in Uganda to overthrow the government. It appears as if the history keeps repeating itself because the same thing happened in Congo. The refugees of the genocide of 1994 are the same refugees that Laura Kabila trained in the FDA, FDL to overthrow Mobutu. So why do you think the Rwandan refugee are constantly being used to overthrow their neighboring country? Yeah, in fact, um, uh, just a quick, uh, quick, quick correction. It was not the refugees. The refugees in the camps after the genocide are the ones who got massacred. But it was actually the the, the same refugees that Mo, Museveni recruited to overthrow the government in Uganda. The same refugees that mm -hmm. came fighting into Rwanda and took over with the RPF uh, are the same people who turned over. around, crossed into the Congo and went and mm. killed and killed their fellow Rwandans, but also killed the most, the biggest loser in this are the Congolese people because yes. more than 6 million people have been killed in the Congo as a result of this invasion. And millions of yes. Congolese have been displaced out of their homes and many of them out of the country. So um, yes, there was a use of refugees. Back to the refugee use though, to be real quick, the M23 right now, this is like a 10 year anniversary of their, first, of their very first announcement of being the M23. Yeah, in March 12, we know, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. In 2012, they did the same thing. They, they, they started a war in Congo. They took over large parts of Congo, displaced nearly a million people within three months of their, the, the initial start of the war, they took over so many, they, at one point they even took over Goma, a large town uh, that is right next to Rwanda. Yeah, then, yeah. then at that point, the US withheld military aid to Rwanda. It was very small amount, 200,000. That's like one person's salary, $200,000, mm -hmm. but it, gave, it made a domino effect and a bunch of other people, a bunch of other countries in the European Union withheld aid from Rwanda, Obama called uh, Kagame, told him to stop. He wouldn't stop. When they stop aid, and so many, so many other countries stop aid to Rwanda, uh, there was one of the things that that happened. There was a like a a, a group of soldiers. It, it was called the International Force Brigade, made of South Africans, Tanzanians, mm -hmm. and Malawians, that went and engaged the rebellion. Now, the reason why I don't call I don't like to call the M23 a rebel group is because have you seen rebels in any place, especially in Africa? Mm -hmm. You see people wearing red hats, you know, like Jordan yeah. jerseys, yeah. you know, some people are wearing, yeah. you know, they have no proper ammunition, basically, basically machetes. Yeah. Yeah. 
But these, these, these guys, groups are organized with ammunition. They look like an official country's military. Military. Their uniforms, yes. their, 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 their equipment and everything. So now the M23 lost. Yeah. You know what they did? They ran to Rwanda in the Congo. I mean, and, you, and they ran to Rwanda in Uganda. And so back to mm -hmm. the use of refugees. Guess what? The same leader, Sultani Makenga, who was for the last 10 years a refugee in Uganda, is leading mm -hmm. the M23 right now. So the Congolese or, or the refugees from the M23 are now being used for their 10 year anniversary. That's what I'm calling it, um, to reinvade the Congo. So the use of refugees yeah, yeah. is definitely rampant. Uh, speaking of using yeah. refugees to destabilize the Congo, Burundian refugees in 2015 that fled to Rwanda were also conscripted by the Rwanda military, yes. turned them into I rebels, about that. fighting yeah. in the Congo. In fact, even right Congolese now, refugees, yes, were, yes, they were massacred in Rwanda. Yes, 2018. I yeah, 2018. Yeah, we lost friends. They protested yes. in Western Rwanda. They mm -hmm. shot them, massacred mm -hmm. at least 12 of them. Yeah. So all that to say, this refugee thing is a big thing. In fact, right now, one of the fears is there is a deal between Rwanda and the UK. It, I call it a human trafficking deal, like officialized human trafficking, because the UK is basically going to take migrants and refugees going to the UK and take them to Rwanda and pay Rwanda to have them. You know, kind of how like you pay for it's somebody political. to take out your trash. Yeah, you know how you pay yeah. somebody to take out your trash? They are treating the people, and I would never call the refugees trash because I was a refugee for many years, uh, but they're mm -hmm. treating those refugees like you would treat, treat trash. That's what the UK is doing. It's very racist, it's very inhumane, yeah. and it's officialized yeah. human trafficking. Now, the fear, the fear is that those people, once they get to Rwanda, they will also be recruited to go fight in the Congo and other places. That's and that's that's the sad reality you know I have yeah. a, I have and a, i know platini you wanted to yeah, dive in i have a follow-up question for you sir i know like i'm a huge fan of poker Dami, of course so <laughs> hearing so much about so much about him is really making me shake like okay so here's my follow-up question based on everything i just learned from from you gentlemen mm -hmm. so uh is poor kagami actually for africa or can we say this man is like a, an agent from the west planted in Africa to serve their best interests. Thank you. Kagame is an agent of the West. I want to start with that sentence and then I will explain it using an analogy. You know, years okay. ago, we, the people, were the resources, just like all this coltan and cobalt and lithium and all that stuff that's coming out of the Congo. We were the yes. resources. They were coming during the transatlantic slave trade. The Europeans would come, they would snatch Africans from Africa, put them on a boat. So I've been to Goree Island in uh, Senegal where they used to pack up hundreds of, of, uh, of, of, of Africans that were taken to, into slavery in really, really tiny rooms. Mm -hmm. So they would take those people, our, sisters, our ancestors, and bring them to the Americas. What did they need? They needed corporations to do the business. They also needed laws and governments to make it, to legalize it, to make it legal. They also needed local agents. So Paul Kagame is the local agent of, of the West in Africa. He's the one that is facilitating the plunder of the Congo. Congo is being, people are stealing, the world is stealing from the Congo and Paul Kagame is facilitating it for them. Paul Kagame is protected by Western powers. Um, when a report called the UN mapping exercise report came out with the, talking about the atrocities in the Congo, the U.S. blocked it. The, U, the, the U.S. Wow. mission to the U.N. blocked the release of the report. We had to organize a campaign to actually have it released. When the M23 invaded the Congo, I mean, uh, I guess, I, I don't know. I don't even know if it's an invasion, but yes, it is an invasion because it was Rwanda invading the Congo. When Rwanda first time as the M23, not the first time Rwanda invaded the Congo, but 
first time as the M23 invaded the Congo in 2012, and the reports were coming out, the US mission to the UN blocked the reports. Susan Rice, she did not want the reports to be released. We had to put up a campaign to have that released. So to make it short, Kagame is an agent of the West. Today, Rwandan troops are serving as mercenaries for the French in Mozambique because the French want to exploit the, 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 the oil in, uh, in Cabo mm -hmm. Delgado. Rwanda's over there. Same as Museveni, by the way. Museveni is also an agent of the West on the African continent. They market themselves as Pan-African. They sometimes, mm. especially Kagame, will lash we out know. the West. I see, I see him so, do that a lot. Yeah, we, we, we know their games. Kagame is being used to invade countries. Museveni is being used to receive refugees. Go to Kampala, you see refugees from everywhere in Africa. Sudan, yeah. Congo, Rwanda, Bu everywhere so, so that's why they dump yes, them Malia, yes ethiopia you name it so they, all, all of them sounding as if they want the best for africa is just like a front that they put it, out it's all it's just part of the game i oh, told you this that they are agents it's, it's I, we argue about this every it's funny day. because we argue about this <laughs> and i told it's you a, they are they are agents facade. you cannot be for africa yeah. and massacre millions of africans i mean that's that's the easiest that's the easiest answer and then the stealing of congolese resources you cannot be for africa and right and then how yeah sorry how can rwanda be the first country to import coltan and we all know rwanda does not mind coltan it comes goma is next door sense. where they mine it and that's what I've been telling you. I did, but do they import it to process it and... No. So why are they importing cotton? They said to the West. That's, that's mad cash. And sketchy, they, don't, they don't mind it. Now, I wanted to touch on one thing you mentioned, very mm -hmm. important about the UN mapping reports. That's the key uh, of this conflict. Now, President Maki Sall, uh, the African chairman now, uh, called for dialogue, right? And then, as you mentioned... Angola, the president of Angola, mm -hmm. hosted uh, President Chisekedi and Paul Kagame uh, to have a dialogue. And of course, we know that was not implemented. They did not reach an agreement. Now, in an interview, in a uh, uh, France 24 interview, uh, the interview President Kagame, he denied the allegations that Kinshasa made against Rwanda. Now, the UN mapping report that we are talking about... <laughs> has everything report every report how rwanda not only support m23 they supply them with ammunition train they supply them with ammunition and military and they train them so how do you think yeah how do you think uh this is being played out so it's funny. I was laughing when you say that uh, Kagame denied the allegations. I remember when he said it uh, on uh, France, Ven, uh, uh, France 24. Uh, France 24. Yes. yes. That was last year. Right. The year before, the general, General James Kabarebe, who is in the report that you're talking about. So it's, there's a mapping report and then there's a report on the M23. Who is in the report on the M23 as the sponsor, you know, as one of the sponsors, providing logistics, recruits, finances, and everything, also denied that anybody, he said that nobody was killed in the Congo. Where are those 3 million bodies? Where is those 6 million bodies that you're talking about? We know that they burned some of the bodies. And there are documentaries. Yeah, I don't mean to cut you. Sorry, there are documentaries where himself... Uh, I think Kabila, Laurent Desiré Kabila, back in 96, he yeah, sent the troops to send them back to Rwanda. They reached the border. He took his gun and shot three million. There's documentary out there and he's bragging about it. Yes, you yes. Know? Him and another general, General Kanyumba Nyamwasa, yes. brag about yes. the things they did in the Congo in a film. The film is called mm -hmm. Afik Amorso. So, yes. now, uh, back to, to, to the M23 and Kagame denying the allegations. The reason why I laughed when you asked that question is, on April 13th, 2010, 
in Rwanda's parliament while he was swearing in military leaders. Paul Kagame said, I'm going to quote him. Uh, he said it in Kenya, Rwanda. So I'm going to paraphrase what he said. He said, we went into the Congo. Those that we wanted to shoot, we shot them. And the ones that we wanted to repatriate, we brought them back to Rwanda. He said it. So now he, and then he goes back last year, uh, a little bit over 10 years after, and he goes, no, it didn't happen. Paul Kagame himself has many times on many occasions admitted going to the Congo. He's admitted to the massacres. His generals have done it. But now that the mapping report is heating up, they start to deny it. And I love the work of mm -hmm. Yeah, and I love the work that Dr. Dennis Mukwege is doing um, in, in the Congo, pushing for justice based on this mapping report. Because you talk about Maki Sal calling for dialogue, uh, for the yeah. African Union. There is one answer to what's happening in the Congo. It's justice. Justice, the perpetrators must be held accountable. The Kagames, the Musevenis, the Kabilas, and everybody that was involved, once they're held accountable, the region will be stable. Everything else, you know, dialogues, I mean, even the president of Kenya, Jomo Kenyatta, he called for a, um, um, what did he call for? Um, a Like an intervention by the by some East African, uh, East African, uh, yeah, but he also wants to send troops Community. from all of these countries, except troops from Rwanda. But if they send the troops that include Ugandan soldiers, I mean, that's one of the perpetrators. What's the point? You know, so justice is the answer. The mapping report really gives, oh, by the way, one last thing about uh, James Kabarebe denying the atrocities and Paul Kagame denying the atrocities. The reason the mapping report was put in place or even started is because they discovered mass graves in the Congo. So uh, what we need is for there to be international tribunals to try the perpetrators who are responsible for the crimes documented in the UN mapping exercise report to start with, and then the M23 reports and the rest of the other reports. All right, so I have a question that I need to shoot to you real quick before we get to your book and everything. So um, it's uh, about Rwanda, of course, with uh, Congo, the situation in, uh, on ground right now. So who do you think is actually funding the rebels? And what is foiling this conflict between the Democratic Republic of Congo and Rwanda? Well, part of who's funding it is me and you, myself, you and, and you two um, uh, co-host. And, and everybody else that's working on this podcast, given that we are based in the US, we pay taxes and our taxes, part of our taxes are going to Rwanda and Uganda. So let's say this to the American citizens, you are paying for the pain and the, the mass murder that's, that's happening in the Congo. This isn't just for the Americans, it's for the British, it's for the Canadians, it's for many people in, the, in Western countries that don't realize that their taxes are actually funding ruthless, war criminals such as Paul Kagame and Yoweri Museveni, that's one. The other is when it comes to direct funding is um, the Rwandan government and the Ugandan government. Paul Kagame and Yoweri Museveni are funding the M23 and the M23 is going out there and killing, um, killing Congolese people. And of course, with the stolen money from Congo's riches, um, Rwanda is able to supplement mm -hmm. the aid. That money that we that we pay um, is supplemented by the riches of the Congo when uh, Kagame and his soldiers and Museveni and his soldiers go into the Congo and start robbing it. In fact, in recent times, part of the fighting and part of the reasons why there is all the fighting, there's also some rivalry between Uganda and in Rwanda, because they are fighting over stealing resources from the Congo. Um, this isn't the first time. In uh, the early 2000s, there was a war, a six day war between Uganda and Rwanda inside of the Congo in Kinsangani, killed 3,000 uh, Congolese people, yeah, innocent people. The six day war, remember that. Yeah. Yes, yeah. the six day war. And today, Uganda is building roads 
near in 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 the in Congo. And what are those roads for? It's to rob the Congo. And so Rwanda is having objections about that also. So all of these are the dynamics of what's happening. But the short answer to 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 your uh, question is, donors to Rwanda and Uganda are sponsoring this um, M23 indirectly, and Rwanda and Uganda are directly sponsoring those fighters, um, the, the M23 fighters in the Congo. That's why I said the, the leader of the M23 was at the meeting. It's Paul Kagame. <laughs> All right. I'll, there's a lot on Hava in this topic, a lot of questions. Unfortunately, the time is running out. I know you co-authored a book uh, called The Survivors Uncensored. Can you tell us a little bit about the book and where we can get it? Yeah, I'm actually, I was trying to see if I have a copy right here at my desk so I can show it to the uh, to the audience, uh, but I hope you'll, uh, you'll show the cover. Um, Survivors Uncensored is a book of testimony. It's uh, over a hundred essays of short testimonies of Rwandan war and genocide survivors, but also people from surrounding countries, Burundians and Congolese, that either were in Rwanda during the genocide or the war that led up to the genocide, or even in the Congo. Many of the stories in there are actually people who survived in the Congo, survived those refugee massacres. Um, but there's also a bunch of stories um, from us, you know, surviving that war uh, from 1990 to 94 and surviving the massacres, uh, I mean, sorry, the genocide in 1994. And then afterwards, you know, what happened to people. It also covers many subjects, things like, you know, uh, I know Platini was uh, saying that he's a big fan of uh, Kagame, but things like sex corruption, where women. I mean, I have a lot of questions right now about him. <laughs> like, that's his like, guy. Like, yeah. How, how women are used to cor basically, uh, they, they are forced to have to, to give sexual favors in order to um in order to uh, to gain opportunities there is also the use of um of, of of young women to sell themselves um part of it was to give false testimony like to go to the course they they package them they give them a statement to read they go to the un courts that was set up to try genocide uh, uh uh, genocide suspects and and suspect and and those who committed war war crimes in 1994, the women would go there. They would read the statement. They would get paid. They read the statements, and if they slept with the like the prosecutors and the judges and stuff like that, they got paid even more money. Um, there's also the use of like spying on foreign dignitaries and VIPs. I mean, these there's so many testimonies in the in this book. There's testimonies of people who disappeared. Um, but the biggest thing about the book is the resilience, the hope, and the strength of the survivors who actually tell those stories, because it's so hard for a Rwandan person to open up and tell a story, let alone uh, tell their own story, let alone make it public. Because what happens to many people who tell their own stories, if you happen to be in Rwanda, if you like it, you end up in jail or in exile. Otherwise, they will disappear you, which means you're dead. They just haven't had a funeral for you because they didn't see the body or they will kill you. Um, I will give an example. There is a guy, his name is Emable Karasira. He survived the Rwandan genocide in 1994. He, he was a university professor. He's a musician. He's a YouTuber. He talked about his story, how he survived the genocide. And then after surviving the genocide, Paul Kagame's RPF actually massacred his, his mother, his father, and siblings, uh, or one of his siblings, his sister for sure. I can't remember if it was a sister. One of the brothers died in the genocide, another brother still alive. His sister was killed by the RPF after the genocide, and his, his parents were killed by the RPF after the genocide. What happened to Imabli Karasira? He's in jail right now in Rwanda. A genocide survivor and he's a, he's he's accused of denying the genocide so i'm showing how difficult it is for rwandans to tell their own stories another person a woman named yvonne idamange 
she came out, you know, among many of the issues that she talked about was the genocide memorials, how they've basically been commercialized and turned into tourist attractions instead of, uh, you know, allowing people to rest in peace. She's in prison. She was she was sentenced to 15 years in prison, and among the crimes that she she was charged with included uh, denying or um, uh, minimizing the genocide. So the government of Rwanda, Paul Kagame has a narrative, and the government, the regime in Rwanda has a narrative that they want to carry a uniform. Uh, narrative. And if you uh, deviate from that narrative, you pay a heavy price. And I just gave those examples so that you can see what kind of price that they have paid. For the people who have written these stories, for the people who are in this book, it's it's actually a courageous act for them to come public and share these stories. So that's why I wanted to just let the audience know these are stories of courage. Survivors uncensored. There is no censorship. There is a variety of stories in there from all kinds of places, including people who had fled to Uganda, by the way, who came fighting with the RPF. Uh, they also gave testimony in there. Um, there's all kinds of, most of the people were children from what I can see from, I mean, I didn't actually do a count, but many of the people who uh, shared the stories were, were children when it happened. Um, so it's an interesting book. It's a, it's definitely gonna challenge challenge you in terms of you know, just uh, digesting the stories. But I think many people will be very inspired by the courage and the humanity in the stories, but also the want and the push for lasting peace, you know, justice, uh, truth telling. I mean, all of that is in the book. So I appreciate you all asking the question about it. And um, I hope that those in the audience will go to Amazon and purchase the book. The book is called Survivors Uncensored. We also have a French version of that book and it's called Survivre par la parole. Survivre par la parole. So for any French speakers who, um, who know, um, uh, uh, who are interested in the book uh, or who prefer French, please go out amazon.com or the Amazon that, you, that is closest to your country and, um, and purchase the book. Thank you. Thank you. Thank so you much. so much, Claude. That was Claude Gadebuke, the co-author of The Survivors Uncensored, the executive director of Great African, the Great Lake Region Network. Thank you so much for joining us today. And the book is on Amazon based on true story. Uh, go and get it. Platini, did you have a Thank you so much, sir. I know the, uh, the conversation between uh, Democratic Republic of Congo and, Ru and Rwanda, we didn't really get to the depth of it so we will really want to invite you again here another time so that we can dig past the poor kagami conspiracy and go right to the root of all of this so thank you so much for showing up here today all right you. thank you my brother thank you. thank you thank you so much for having us thank you guys so much all right i mean you don't have to hang up they can cut the camera but <laughs> you can cut you can cut we can talk right Oh, okay. How do we find you online? Okay, yeah. You're, you're on social media platform, you know, website. Start, start all over again. Okay. Calm down then. Okay. Okay. Uh, so where can people find you uh, on your... Do you have a website, social media platform or... Yes, I encourage everybody to start with just following us on social media. Um, my uh, my social media is at shi. That, that this is Twitter at shinani1 at shinani1. Um, my uh, Facebook is my name Claude Katebuke, and uh, you can also follow our organization the African Red Lakes Action Network on both uh, Facebook and Twitter. Um, and then our website is www.aglan.org. All right. Thank, Thank you, you so, so much. much. There you have it. And please consider visiting them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.